Hey, Slater Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Happy Thursday, best day of the week. Glad you're here. Uh, I gotta start off with this story. This, this uh, I hope is not, well, I'm, I'm certain this isn't the only story like this. And we're learning more every day, which I guess is a good thing. Rather learn than not. Uh, January 30th, the New England Journal of Medicine, right, which has this, this air about it that it can do no wrong. New England Journal of Medicine. We did a segment a couple weeks back about how they fell for that ventilator trick that we need a million ventilators. But that's not true. We don't need a million ventilators. The original article that New England Journal of Medicine quoted said a million people might need to be ventilated. Right? A million people might need to be on ventilators, but that's very different than we need a million ventilators. Big difference between that and the New England Journal of Medicine f fell for that. Anyway. So uh, they did a study, January 30th, about, do we, I think we have the headline here. Do we have the headline of the study just so you can show we're not making it up? Uh, this is a study about the first four people in Germany that got COVID. And they made a conclusion in this study about asymptomatic spread. Right? Asymptomatic spread, that's, that's the big deal about this virus. That's arguably the worst thing about this virus. If it were simply you have a sore throat and you have, you have symptoms, then you spread it, well, that'd be much easier because then if you have symptoms, then you just don't go anywhere, right? But the problem with this is you can spread it before you even know you have it. So that's why we all have to act like we're sick all the time. That's why everybody has to wear a mask all the time because you could be spreading it and not even know you have it. You show up before you have symptoms, asymptomatic spreaders, right? So this is like the big problem with COVID. And this is why everyone's taking precautions is if you're sick, right? So this is January 30th, and this was the original paper that, that made that argument. It's now May 21st, crazy. So is that true? Everything needs to be questioned all the time. Uh, Dr. Fauci, after the study, he said there's no doubt, after reading this paper, he's referring to this paper, he said there's no doubt that asymptomatic transmission is occurring. The study, this study lays the question to rest. Ah, I hate hearing stuff like that. I, I hope we're never laying anything to rest. Still too much happening to ever lay anything to rest. And, and then you rest on that conclusion forever, and it may not be true or fully true. So here's the story. There was a uh, businesswoman from Shanghai, and she flew into Germany, and she met with four people on, uh, this is near Munich, on January 20th and 21st. She had a meeting, uh, and then those four people later got sick. They got COVID. Uh, crucially, she wasn't sick at the time. I'm quoting from the study here. During her stay, she had been well, her stay in Germany. She'd been well, with no sign or symptoms of infection, but had become ill on her flight back to China. This is the original study, January 30th. The fact that asymptomatic persons are potential sources of COVID infection may warrant a reassessment of transmission dynamics of the current outbreak. Because that's like the, hey everyone, here's this woman, got these four people sick, she wasn't sick, asymptomatic spread, holy cow, big deal, January 30th, at the very beginning of this whole thing, right? That's the study. Lays the question to rest. Here's the rub, the researchers, never talked to the woman. They never talked to the woman. What? How could you, how could you have never t talked to the... It turns out this paper relied on just information from the four people who got sick. And those four people said it did not appear that the woman had any symptoms. The heck is that? How reliable is that? That's that's totally worthless. Can you tell if I have a sore throat right now? If you're watching this right now, would you what would you would you say I'm healthy or sick? How can you tell? Can you tell if my muscles are aching? Can you tell if I have a headache right now? Of course not. So we're gonna we're gonna write scientific papers based on other people's assessment of other people and they're out. No way, like that's, there's no reliability to that. I was thinking about this the other day actually. It's barely even reliable to ask a person 
their health history and and when they started getting sick and all these other things. Like it's really hard even just a direct, so even if you did talk to the woman from Shanghai and ask her when her symptoms started, it would be difficult to kind of conclude. But let alone if you ask someone else what they think this person's symptoms were. But if I went to, let's say I got sick, uh, or I went to the doctors in like a week from now. So I started to get symptoms today, so Thursday, and then I go to the doctors in a week or two weeks, right? And the doctor's like, oh, when did you start, first start showing symptoms? Like, even I'd be like, I don't know, like, um, I don't know, like late last week, something, like maybe, I was like, Fridays. I don't know, Friday maybe, Friday, Saturday? No, Wednesday, it was Wednesday, right? Like even I would be an unreliable source and I'm the one who's sick. Like who's out there keeping a personal medical journal? Actually, that's a pretty good idea now that I think about that. In case you do get sick, you can just be like, oh, here, here's all the places I went and here's how I felt every day. That would be pretty good. But no one's doing that. But the least reliable thing is, is someone else's assessment of me. So it turns out health officials did later get in touch with that woman from Shanghai and shocker of shockers, she said she felt tired, she had muscle pains, and she took Tylenol to lower her fever while in Germany. Guys, that's a totally different story. This is uh, the virologist Christian Drostrin of uh, University in Berlin. Uh, this is the person who did the lab work for the study and is one of the authors of the study. I feel bad about how this went. So that's why, that's why I'm sharing this story, by the way, not just like the people who wrote it are admitting it, right? This isn't me like reading too far into it. Like the people who wrote it are like, ah, oh, geez, like I feel bad about how this went, but I don't think anybody's at fault here. Apparently the woman could not be reached at first and people felt this had to be communicated quickly. All right, fine, but how about you say that? How about in the study, you say, hey, here's what the four people said. We haven't been able to get in touch with the woman. So we don't know for sure, but we just wanted to let you know what we know so far and you know, we'll update this. They didn't say any of that. They made it seem as if this was all like the woman said. She didn't have any symptoms. That's dishonest, that's deceitful. That's not like, ah, you know, we just didn't have all the info, but here's what we got. No, this, that's way worse than that. Uh, this is an epidemiologist at Harvard. Uh, he said this, is, this study's problematic. In retrospect, it sounds like this was a poor choice. However, in an emergency setting, it's often not possible to talk to all the people. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to talk to all the people, but how about the one person? <laughs> Can you talk to the one person? I'm assuming this was an overstretched group trying to get out their best idea of what the truth was quickly rather than somebody trying to be careless. Okay, all right, you get it. So uh, a couple lessons that we're reminded of. Uh, the infallibility of human beings. We'll start with that one. Scientists, by the way, are human beings. It's worthy to think about that. Scientists are not oracles or God sent angels to tell us the truth of the Bible. They're just human beings and they can be victims of the same pressures that anyone else is subject to. Money, fame, the desire to be first, praise within their circles. Uh, even good intentions, right? But intentions that don't lead to the truth. And it's not, it's not, it's not a true just because the scientist says. I heard Pelosi the other day, she, she was talking about HCQ and how it's bad or whatever. And she said, the scientists say, the scientists? What are the scientists? What does that even mean? They're people. So we need to take in the experts' opinions, no doubt about it. That's why we talked with uh, that's why we talk with Vincent Racaniello every Monday, right? He's an expert who I trust. Seems super sensible, not like either far on either extreme. He's just like a science guy. So I bring him questions. I take an, I take I have a word document with questions that I think of during the week that I bring to him because I want to know his opinion. He's an expert. I don't know all this stuff, but you're a smart person too. So don't grant them all of your critical thinking skills. Continue to ask questions and come to conclusions too. Simple questions. Sometimes these people are too smart for their own good. Do, I don't know, did we talk on the TV show about this uh, Victor Davis Hanson? I don't know if we did. Victor Davis Hanson wrote this great piece about how epidemiologists may know uh, some fancy epidemiological equation that we've never heard of. But it might take a lowly accountant to question, hey, 
how can you guys calculate fatality rate if you don't know the numerator or the denominator? <laughs> if you don't know the, the deaths from COVID or the number of cases, how can you calculate fatality rate at all? Right, so it takes, like, the, the epidemiologist is, like, so focused on these big models and equations. They're not asking the simple questions. And it takes regular people to ask simple questions. A simple question like, hey, you said she had no symptoms, but did you ask her? <laughs> like that's that's a simple question that all the scientists were like, oh, we got to we got to get got to get this out, got to get this out. And it takes a simple person to say, did you ask the woman? No, no, we didn't ask her. We didn't ask her. But what's the difference, really? Oh, I don't know. The entire reaction from everyone in the world is based on the claim that it can be spread before you have symptoms. That's all. No big deal. Now, could it be spread asymptomatically? Maybe. That's the thing. I know. I know. We don't. I don't want you to go away from the study being like, oh, Slater says uh, it can't be spread asymptomatic. I don't know. Maybe it still can, but this study doesn't prove it. True story. Thanks, Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders. So there's this guy I've been following on the uh, tweet machine. His name is Alex Berenson. Uh, he is vehemently against all, all the hysteria in every way, like as far against all of it as, as anyone could possibly be. And I followed him pretty much this whole time just to get another perspective, because I disagree with him on a lot of stuff, um, but I've always wanted to see what, what he was up to and, and all that. Um, so right or wrong, he has been attacked <laughs> mercilessly by the left. And again, just a quick background, like this, this whole thing shows how strong the gravitational force of political hatred is. Based on like all social science research, it should be conservatives who are more concerned about a foreign virus, right? Like the, like the conservatives should be like, ah, we got a virus, because one of their moral foundations is purity and, and uh, so, so like, a, like an unclean virus coming from China. It should be the conservatives who are more freaking out. And it should be progressives who are all like, oh, hey, man, like one love, world peace, it's all good, no big deal. But it's the other way around. And that's because Trump's president. Because that's the biggest gravitational force in our lives today. And that's a shame. If Obama were president, no doubt about it, this would be covered a completely different way. That is an absolute fact. Now, undeniably, what, where like 100,000 people have died, it's probably going to get to 200,000 by the end of this whole thing. So... It's still a thing. You couldn't like, completely bury it, but it's amazing how the media can spin whatever they want to spin. So because Trump is president and they have to be against everything he does no matter what, new battle lines have been drawn based off of that. So anyway, uh, Alex Berenson has been attacked by the left and, and he wrote this little tweet thread about why. So here's his analysis as to why. Uh, he said, I thought a bit about why the media blue check marks hate me so much. Uh, I'm a nobody, really. I don't have a primetime show or a syndicated column. I have 100,000 followers on Twitter. But I'm a particular burr for three reasons. And I want to talk about number one and number three. First, I'm a class traitor. Not just because I worked for the New York Times for 10 years and wrote lots of hardball pieces about companies, not to mention our failures in Iraq, that make me tough to dismiss as a right-wing nutter, as much as they'd like to try. But I'm a class trader in another arguably more important way. The media and the academic left try to cudgel its opponents with an attitude of mocking scorn and intellectual superiority. We'll get to all that in a second. But that game doesn't work with me. I am as credentialed as the people shouting at me. Only I follow the facts where they go. This is why they hated Tell Your Children so much. So Tell Your Children was his most recent book, and it was about how marijuana is really bad for you. Uh, he said, one can know cannabis has serious mental health risks and still want it legalized. But the blue checks have been telling each other the same nonsense for so long they genuinely didn't understand that cannabis was dangerous. I keep on merrily presenting studies and facts, and even if the media won't pay attention, other people will. So I love this idea of being a class trader. He is elite. He went to Yale. He wrote for the New York Times. He has all the credentials. By the way, the media uh, and the left, they hate Trump for many reasons, but one of them also, maybe one of the biggest, is because he's a class traitor too. If Trump were a Democrat, 
he would be the greatest hero since FDR in the White House. He'd be a successful businessman who went to Penn. By the way, do you ever hear that Trump went to an Ivy League school for college? Have you, did you even know that? Have you, have you ever heard that? That he went to Penn, he went to the University of Pennsylvania. He went to the Wharton School, the best business school in the world. You ever hear that? Never. But if he, if he was, if this, if it was Obama who went to Penn, you'd hear about it nonstop. So Trump is, lately, his whole life he hasn't been, because right, the media has fawned over him forever, but now he's a traitor to them. Now he's just a, a crazy, morbidly obese guy who tells people to drink bleach. That's why the media frames him that way. He's betrayed them. He's a traitor to their class. Amazing. Um, so anyway, Alex is the same thing. He doesn't toe that party line. So he's a traitor as well. Oh, so is um, McKenney, or who's the press secretary? What's her name? She went to, she's doing awesome, by the way, but she went to, what was her under? Georgetown, and then went to Oxford, and then got her law degree from Harvard. She's Harvard Law. So she's a class traitor, too. Again, this is one reason why people hate him. Uh, second thing is, he's not a hypocrite, uh, and then I want to skip that, but here's the, here's the third reason why the media hates this guy so much. Uh, the third reason is the most obvious. The hysterics have been wrong. They know it, whether they admit it or not, except for the most at-risk populations who should be the focus of our protective efforts. COVID looks to be a minor risk. So as it depends how you define minor, right? I could have some disagreement with that. Um, but he's absolutely right that the left is not reassessing quickly enough, to say the least. How many segments have we done about being agile and flexible and the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, and always constantly going through that process? Um, and the left is not doing that. The media is not doing that. And many politicians are not doing that quickly enough. Um, there's a great line from Thomas Sowell, who's the best ever. He said, people will forgive you for being wrong but they will never forgive you for being right, especially if the events prove you right while proving them wrong. And there's going to be a lot of that moving forward here. And you're, these politicians with so much pride are going to be impossibly reluctant to ever admit it. Uh, Robert Heinlein, he said, being right too soon is socially unacceptable. <laughs> That's a great line. Being right too soon is socially unacceptable. So maybe, maybe one day, as I, as I think of that quote, maybe one day the, you know, de Blasio and the rest will kind of come around to uh, something that's closer to the truth, but they don't want to do it too soon, right? And they got to kind of wait to see if it's socially acceptable to finally have uh, more accurate and proper positions on things. So until then, you get stupid stuff like this. So de Blasio, it's a Memorial Day weekend this weekend, right? Which I didn't even know until like a couple days ago. But, uh, it's Memorial Day weekend, and he said, he said, he said, if you want to go, he said, if you want to walk on the beach, that's fine. Thank you, Mayor. But he said, no swimming, no parties, no barbecues, and if anyone tries to get in the water, they'll be taken right out of the water. Be taken out of the water. He said there will be fencing in position, but it doesn't have to be put up unless we have to take tougher measures. Like, what does that even, what does that mean? There'd be fencing, what are you going to put, you're going to put the fence, like, on the beach in front of the water? Like, what is that even, what are you talking about? What are you going to pull people out of the water? What would that even look like? And why? Why would you do that? Why could you walk on the beach, but you can't walk in the water? And to what depth? Like, can your, can you go ankle deep? Can your, can your little feeties and your little tootsies get in the water? You don't touch water at all. What are you, what are you doing? Why does it make no sense? But the media will quickly forgive de Blasio for being so wrong that they'll never forgive you for being right. True story. Thanks later. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders. So I was on Fox & Friends this last weekend, live from my kitchen. Uh, talking about California. California is a metaphor here for all the blue states and how they're going to respond to this economically. Uh, but Newsom has made the claim that he is going, unless, unless the federal government bails him out, unless Trump comes in and bails him out, he is going to cut state employees' pay and cut education spending. 
That's the, that's the big threat. And I don't know how many times we have to do this. We could do it definitely once a year. He's not going to do that. I'd be shocked if he actually cut any state employees' pay or education spending. This is the all, if you don't pay up, we're going to do the worst thing possible. Usually it's to convince you to raise taxes, right? So if you don't pay up and, and increase taxes, then we are going to cut, we're going to get rid of all the fire departments. And all the and that's it. No more fire, and you're, everyone's gonna burn to death. And that's it. That's, you really better pay. And it's like, come on. And people fall for it every time. And literally, the, Newsom did this. He said, "You got to give us money, Mr. President, or else we're gonna cut spending on fighting wildfires." <laughs> so they, he did that. And we're not gonna make any cuts anywhere else in our 220 billion dollar budget, which 10 years ago was 90 billion. California, the budget 10 years ago was 90. I don't know for sure, but it was like 10 years before that, it was like 30 or something. Like it's gone up crazy. Uh, but I know for certain 10 years ago, it was $90 billion. And now it's $220 billion, And it's like, oh, man, just nowhere else we can cut. We just have to, we have to, just have to close down all the schools. I mean, <laughs> to, but by the way, most of, like to that, I say good. To both of those threats, I say good. But you, you see what he's doing there. So uh, this is in The Hill, and I know we have other headlines. You see it everywhere. But the one I saw from The Hill said, uh, Newsom says first responders would be the first ones laid off if states don't get federal assistance. First responders? What do you... Why would you... Out of all the people... That's who you're going to respond first? It's ridiculous. And you know this because we do this every year. But if you took a pay cut, which many people listening now have, no one says, oh, my kids are going to starve to death. I'm just, I, or not even that. It's like, well, I guess I'm not going to feed my kids. That's what, that's just, like, I don't have any money. I, you know, I, got a, I took a pay cut. Well, sorry, sorry, kids, you're not eating. No, you look for every, where else just cut your spend? You cut your cable bill, you cut your cell phone bill, you cut these other expenses so that you can continue to pay for your top priorities first. So it's a classic government trick, and people will always fall for it. People will always do. Trump won't. I hope he won't. You won't fall for it, Mr. President, will you? Uh, you know, Gavin Newsom keeps doing this, we're all in this together thing. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not all in this together. Oh, someone had a funny tweet. I retweeted it here. Let me pull this up here. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I ever said we're all in this together, but we're I'm definitely not. Don't fall for that line. That's such a stupid, empty line. Here, someone said, I'm boycotting any company that uses the word in these trying times in an unprecedented time, or we're all in this together in an ad. <laughs> we're not all in this together. Get over that. The health director in LA, the, the woman we've talked about before, she has a PhD in social work, and she's the big health director. She makes $500,000 a year. She's not in this together with the person she won't let go to work. You kidding me? The unions are not in this together with you. They're going to do everything in their power, the state unions, to make sure that they're not affected in any way whatsoever. I'd be shocked if the, the, they ended up taking a 10% pay cut. It's just not gonna happen. Are there any state workers who aren't getting paid now? I'm sure they're all getting paid, and I'm sure there's some that aren't even going to work. So that's the first thing. It's not gonna happen. Empty threat, don't, don't fall for it. Second thing, uh, any sensible person in California, and there's not many left, but we've been saying for years that we need to prepare for disasters. We need a, a bigger rainy day fund. We need a bigger, by far, not every close. So mostly when we talk about that, we talk about an earthquake, which could come at any moment. But either way, we weren't, you know, I, no one was thinking pandemic. Like we, gotta, we need a bigger rainy day because there's going to be a pandemic. No one said that. But still, we needed a bigger rainy day fund. So we weren't prepared financially at all. $20 billion was California's rainy day fund. $20 billion. It sounds like a lot. But the Northridge earthquake in 1994, it caused, in today's dollars, $75 billion. So you could have an earthquake that has 25% of the damage that the, North, that the Northridge one did in 94. 25% of damage and the rainy day fund's gone. So that was, like, that was nothing, that rainy day fund. That'd be like you having a rainy day fund of, of 50 bucks. So we were never really prepared for this. And now Newsom's gonna beg DC for money, which is gonna be paid for by one of two things. Either you in Texas or Oklahoma or some responsible state, so you're gonna have to bail us out, or it's gonna be money borrowed from China. That's, that's going to pay for California's irresponsibility? No, it's not appropriate. And I, again, I hope Trump doesn't fall for it. 
What's going to be interesting to see moving forward are the different um, different paths that states take, red and blue states. They're going to have completely different economic recovery plans. Some states are going to lower taxes in response to all this, which is, of course, the right thing to do. Let people keep more of the money they earn once they're allowed to earn it. And other states are going to raise taxes. And you're going to see the exact... Yesterday we did the segment on the Great Accelerator. That's a perfect example, right? States that, like blue states like California that raise taxes, they're going to raise them faster and more. And states that are kind of on the slower track of lowering taxes, like a Tennessee or something, uh, they're going to lower them faster and more. So it's another example of a, of a great accelerator. The problem for California, and I'm sure the other blue states too, 50% of California's tax revenue comes from people who are making more than $500,000 a year. So people who make more than half a million, they're responsible for 50% of the California's tax revenue. So we have a very volatile revenue stream. I think it was, um, whatever year it was, I know some, some year Zuckerberg had some, did some big thing. I don't know if the year he went public for Facebook or whatever, but just Zuckerberg, I don't know if it was just his taxes or just even his increase in taxes was two and a half billion dollars. <laughs> right, so, so Sacramento was like, oh, we're flush with cash. And it was because of Zuckerberg. So you see how it's volatile, but it's good and good, really, really good in good times, but really, really bad in bad times. And of course, rich people can leave very easily to a place with no income tax and like a yard. And they're gonna take half of the state's revenue with them, which has been a big a problem for a long, long time. But again, it's gonna be an accelerated problem now. So then that puts a bigger burden on the middle class people who are, have to stay because you're stuck here. And that's going to lead Newsom to raise taxes even more. Yesterday we talked about Joe Rogan leaving. Uh, so Joe Rogan just signed a hundred, a hundred million dollar uh, deal with Spotify. A hundred million dollars. Okay, so that like the state's going to see a huge tax increase revenue. But I've heard he makes 50 million a year. So 13%, that's the state income tax. Isn't that crazy? 13% is uh, it's like six, seven million dollars. So he leaves, boom, seven million, go seven million dollars gone from Sacramento. One person, and he's not the richest person in the state at all. So there's gonna be an accelerator of people moving out of California, which really stinks for you, by the way, if you live in any other state, because those people are gonna bring their blue Democrat philosophies with them and screw up your state too. It's like, a, speaking of viruses, Democrats in California are like a virus. Or we can all stop with this nonsense and just let people go back to work if they want with proper precautions and start earning money again. As Adam Carolla said, uh, Gavin Newsom just tacked on three more months to our sentence for good behavior. We've done everything right in California and we're still getting punished for it. Uh, I gotta run here, but speaking of sentencing, I gotta throw this in here. Newsom's other plan is to shut down prisons. He wants to close prisons. Not because of people in there getting sick with COVID, but because of the budget problems, budget shortfalls, where he wants to shut down prisons. Like, what are you talking, like, of all the things, you're gonna shut down prisons. He wants to shut down two state prisons and all three state-run juvenile prisons. I think we have a quote from, uh, as the examiner. Uh, he's seeking unspecif unspecified increases to sentencing credits that allow inmates to leave prison more quickly. He proposes to shorten parole to a maximum of two years down from five. Why? Why would you do that? And let ex-felons earn their way off supervision in just a year. What would? What? Or 18 months for sex offenders. Why? What? The Democratic governor called it a core value of his administration to eliminate prisons and invest more in education. Eliminate prisons. I never understand. I hear this all the time. People are like, oh, prisons are overcrowding. It's like, well, yeah, of course they are. Like, what? The prison populations are only going to go up because people get sentenced for a long time and then more people commit crimes and go in there. Like, we should be building more prisons. I don't understand that. There's a big Supreme Court case, I don't know, six years ago maybe, that said California prisons are so overcrowded, it's a cruel and unusual punishment. And you have to let people, you have to let people out of prison. And I, I heard that I said, okay, sure, fine. Cruel and unusual, too crowded. But couldn't you just build more prisons? So we should be building more prisons, and instead we're now shutting them down. LA Times wrote an article the other day about the 3,500 prisoners that were released because of COVID. And that doesn't even make any sense. I never understood that from the jump, because if you had it, like if prisons are like this breeding ground of COVID, and everyone there's got COVID, why would you let people out where they're just gonna, gonna go spread it 
where they live, in the town where they live. Right? That doesn't make any sense at all. But in this article, they talk about uh, people who have no job potentials because everything's shut down. So you take probably sick people, right? Probably COVID-infected people, and then you put them in a place with no job opportunities. And good luck. How does that plan make any sense? But this is what we do in California. This is what we do. We, we, the things we need the most, the things we need the most, we get rid of them. <laughs> we get rid of them. Like, every sane and logical person for years has said, hey, we should build more nuclear power plants in California. That would help with our rolling blackouts, rolling brownouts. It would help with uh, lower, lower electricity costs. We get the highest electricity costs in the country, so that would lower our electricity costs. Uh, it would be good for the environment. We'd have no carbon emissions. We should build more nuclear power plants. And Jerry Brown, our last governor, he said, that sounds great. We're going to shut down all the power plants that we have left. Thank you very much for that. I said, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. We need to build more nuclear power plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to shut them all down right away. There's a nuclear power plant. I don't know, 20 minutes from where I'm sitting right now, they shut it down a couple years ago. Just shut the whole thing down. It's been there for, for decades. They just shut it down. What? What are, you do? what are you guys doing? Same thing with water storage. Hey, we should build more water storage for future droughts that happen every, you know, every couple of years or so. Um, so we need more water capacity so that we can get through those, those drought times. And Jerry Brown said, it sounds great. Let's vote for a $10 billion water bond and we'll use it to tear down dams and, and decrease water storage. <laughs> no, Governor, sorry. Increase, we need to increase water storage. Yeah, yeah, decrease water storage. Just give me $10 billion, I'll get right on it. That's what Jerry Brown did in California, decreased water, water storage capacity. Same thing with prisons. We need to build more prisons. Gavin Newsom, great idea. Let's shut down these two as fast as we can. <laughs> this state, ridiculous. I make the argument that for a lot of these prisoners, it might be safer and better for them to stay in jail. Better than having to go, or having nowhere to go and living in homeless camps. And then if you didn't already have the disease, you get the disease there. If you already did, you spread it in the homeless camp. What good does that do for anybody? We're talking about quarantining everybody, but we have people who are in a quarantine and we're gonna let them out. But you, you, you come in contact with somebody who might have COVID and you have to go back in quarantine? One person, she was in jail for 11 years. Uh, she got released, she the DMVs closed. So I can't get an ID card, I can't get anything. Uh, she doesn't know where her social security card is, can't open a bank account, doesn't have a credit history, We're, but good luck. And now in California, we have zero bail for most crimes, so no one's going into jail. One guy stole a car, he was detained, zero, a zero dollar bail, 37 minutes later, he carjacked someone else. This is up in Oakland. So the sheriff of Alameda County, he said there was a mass hysteria to de-incarcerate over COVID-19, and he said it's, it was, uh, it's now been proven, or it's, it was not based on any fact or scientific evidence, but based on fear. Of all the things to do when you're concerned about a virus, you release people from prison? So you want to talk about the biggest way that the left is going to make sure that no crisis goes to waste and that this crisis doesn't go to waste? It's going to be with our prisons, which is arguably the worst thing they should be reforming. And it's not getting enough attention. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Slater Crusaders, thanks for being here. I want to uh, make again this point that I've now made ad nauseum. We have beaten this horse dead many, many times. Uh, human nature, the limits of human nature. If you are a politician and you are not taking every recommendation and filtering it through the reality of human nature's limits, then you are doing nothing. You are doing nothing. Nothing matters if no one's going to do it. I feel like every t COVID task force across the country should have, like, just like some guy. <laughs> you have all your, like, you imagine the, the big table, and you have all the epidemiologists, and you have all the serologists, and you have all the public health experts, and you have all the big impressive people. And then you just need, like, you need, like, Bruce from Staten Island or whatever, right? You just need, like, you just need, like a guy. And everything needs to be run through him. Truly, he's like the most important person on the whole board. Because if this board comes up with some grand conclusion of things we need to do, and then you run it through Bruce, and he says, no, nah, no one's going to do that. All right. Back to the drawing board, guys. Like, no one's going to do it. So we got to come up with something people are going to do. 
So an economist or whoever, no, not epidemiologist, not economist, epidemiologist says we need to quarantine everyone for 14 days. So if you're, if, if we do the contact tracing and uh, it says you were in a Starbucks last week with someone who now has COVID and you need to quarantine for 14 days, right? That's the idea. So everyone's got to quarantine for 14 days if you're near anyone who had, who had COVID. Like, okay, guys, great idea, good work, scientists. Bruce, what do you think? Like, and Bruce is like, nah, that's not happening. Okay, all right, guys. Bruce says it's not happening. So, what, what can you? What, what do you got? What, what else can you come up with? And they're like, no, it's got to be 14 days. Bruce, it's got to be 14 days. It's like, it's not, Bruce is like, it's not happening. I'm not doing 14 days. All right, Bruce, what do you do? What will you do? I'll do three to five days with two negative tests. That's what I'll do. I'll give you three to five days, two negative tests. That's the best I can do. And you're like, all right, epidemia. That work, was that good? Can we do three to five days, two negative tests? Because that's all Bruce is going to give you. I mean that seriously. You gotta have just a regular guy on every panel. Because what's the point of mandating all these things that no one's gonna do? <laughs> then you're gonna get major backlash from it if, if you try to force it. And then you're gonna lose a bunch of goodwill when you need to, when you really need people to do things, right? Yesterday, it was yesterday we did a segment on vaccines and uh, how the government can force you to take vaccines, right? And you have no constitutional right to not take one if, if it's a disease that can spread to other people. Anyway. Um, like, if politicians really, really, really want people to take vaccines, I don't think many will. But you know what will cause people to definitely not take vaccines? If de Blasio rips people out of the water over Memorial Day weekend. Right? No one's going to follow your orders, de Blasio, next week when you pull him out of the water on Monday. You with me? That guy, maybe he was kind of on your side throughout this whole thing. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go to the beach. And then um, he goes to the beach, and he's like, it's going to kind of happen. I'm going to kind of take a little quick dip in the water. And you call the lifeguards and the National Guard to rip him out of the water. He's never going to do anything you ever say. So use your power wisely. A lot of you guys are pushing the limits a little too far. You need to take Bruce's advice. I was going to call him Lenny. I don't know which is better. Go with Bruce. Uh, LA Times, Doyle McManus. This is a good guy. Good guy in the LA Times. I have to say that because when I think LA Times, it's going to be like some super far left thing, but this guy was very sensible. He said, uh, do, 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 do. he says, we need to administer tens of millions of tests to find out who has the disease, then trace all their recent contacts using a cell phone app that, the, that tells the government whom they've met. Finally, track down all these people and order them into isolation for 14 days, probably in a quarantine hotel. Uh, now think of that scenario. In a country where armed men are marching to defend their right not to wear masks, how will intrusive measures like those go down? Answer, not easily. My public health, this is, a, this is a professor at Stanford's medical school. He's a psychiatry professor. My public health friends are working out brilliant solutions, solutions for the technical problems, but they haven't confronted the challenge of political culture. That's, that's human nature. We've been, that's the word we've been using. Uh, what are we going to do if millions of people refuse to take the test? What are we going to do if they refuse to isolate themselves or close their businesses? He's totally right. And we've talked about this again, ad nauseum. We have this amazing country that's all about individual rights. And, and just by our, like our to core of our being, we're not an obedient people. We're not subjects to the crown. We're citizens, very different. The Constitution enshrines our right to rebel. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's one of, as, as this writer said, it's one of the glories of American life. But in the face of a pandemic, it gets in the way of protecting the larger community. So you have to balance that properly. And many politicians are pushing it way, way, way too far. I use that example about the 14 days because finally some health person from Harvard is saying you can't isolate people for 14 days. You just you can't do that anymore, right? Maybe in the beginning when people were like, oh, we don't even know what this is. You could do the 14 days. And the 14 days thing was just completely made up, right? Why do we do 14 days? Like, I don't know, two weeks? That's just where that came from. So we're way past that now. But you're not going to get the compliance. You're not going to get people to stay inside for 14 days. In a perfect world, maybe. But you're really, you're gonna, and this doctor said three to five days. You're going to get about three to five days. And then you do two negative tests, and you're negative on both tests, and you're free to go. It makes way more sense. Because you can't, you're near someone who maybe had COVID. 14, like, what are you talking about? Like, I got kids. I got kids. I'm not going to leave my wife to become like a single mom with three kids because I was in a store with someone. Like, that's stupid. 
So we'll never see 100% compliance. But I don't think we need it. Like, be happy with 70%. That's really good. Take that and be grateful. I got a second here. Let me end with this. This is uh, one of my favorite guys on Twitter. Uh, he, used to be, he used to write for Cracked.com, but he just left and doing more of his own stuff. He said, is there a specific term for the logical fallacy of this plan works perfectly as long as humans behave like robots and not humans? Examples, and we mused about this one the other day, abstinence-only sex education. Teen pregnancy would be 100% eliminated if everybody would stop having sex. Other examples, any kind of drug or alcohol prohibition. Uh, the do, 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 we don't need labor laws because workers can just quit. Communism works perfectly as long as the citizens never feel or act on personal greed, envy, or the need to have better stuff than their neighbors. Whatever it's called, I feel like some of us have strayed into it in this pandemic, assuming that humans would simply go without real life contact with other humans for months on end. Assuming they function on a cold, machine-like calculation of risk rather than emotion and impulse. We're not robots. <laughs> and that can be a tough pill to swallow too, what, what he just articulated here, because some of those policies, like I do support. I, I support. I support certain policies that assume people act like cold, hard machines, like cogs in a wheel. So even I need to like be like, okay, okay, we can't, right? And we need to think about what's reality and balance that properly. So what's it called? Well, there's, there's, someone chimed in and called it the nirvana fallacy, which is closely related to the perfect solution fallacy. So you, a bunch of these, maybe you've thought this before, like uh, these anti-drunk driving campaigns, they're not going to work. What's the point? These are stupid. People are still going to drink and drive no matter what. That's what they'll say. And you're like, okay, yeah. We're not looking to completely eliminate everybody from driving drunk. We're just trying to reduce the number of people who do, right? Or people say, oh, seatbelts are stupid. People are still going to die in car crashes. It's like, yes, okay, we're not looking for 100% of safety, but it will reduce your likelihood of dying in a car, right? I guess the argument is don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. I like that line. I think masks are a pretty good example now, right? People are like, oh, you can still get sick wearing a mask. Virus particles could land in your eye. Okay, yes, it's true. We're trying to decrease transmissions and help people decrease the risk but of governors, right? There are a lot of like, well, listen, if we don't get 100% compliance, then it's going to spread, and then we're all going to get sick, and it's like we're doing nothing. We need a... Uh, Mayor of uh, L.A. Garcetti said, I'm going to go after the last 0.1%. 0.1%. Guys, guys, got to work within the confines of reality. Got to work within the limits of human nature. Otherwise, you're doing nothing. Or you're more likely making things even a lot worse. Tomorrow, got our special. We're going to talk to a gym owner in San Diego who got arrested for opening up. This guy's awesome. We're going to talk to a uh, local mayor who's opening things up and things are going well so far. And then we're going to talk big picture of what are the, what are the principles at play here? What are the underlying principles of how we should proceed? Good stuff. I'm excited for tomorrow's special. It's coming up tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Spread the word.